Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Bagley and I'm the Ecosystem Science and Management Fellow with Long Live the Kings. Today I'll be discussing how marine plastics may impact salmon in the Salish Sea through direct or indirect consumption. In 2010, plastics was estimated to enter the oceans at a rate between 4.8 and 12.7 million metric tons per year. And that range is predicted to increase in order of magnitude by 2025 under a business as usual scenario. So needless to say, plastic is a pervasive marine pollute. Plastics that enter the marine environment do so either through marine-based activities such as fishing, shipping, or aquaculture, or through land-based activities that result in wastewater effluent, river discharge, or runoff. Common types of plastic, either in their raw or broken down form, that end up as marine pollution include polystyrene, otherwise known as styrofoam, polypropylene, which is used to make a lot of hard consumer plastics, or polyethylene, which is used to make many flimsy consumer plastics like plastic bags. Researchers are particularly interested in the effects from microplastic and nanoplastic consumption in zooplankton and forage fish because these smaller sized plastics are the most likely to be consumed. Challenges associated with Assessing micro and nanoplastic distribution and abundance make it an understudied concept despite its widespread prevalence. Factors impacting its spatial distribution include ocean currents, horizontal, vertical, and wind mixing, biofilm formation, and the characteristics of the individual plastic polymers. Davis III and Murphy published a study in 2015 kind of summarizing two independent studies. The first study is on the left, and this looked at plastic in surface waters of the inside passage. Results from this study showed that plastic was ubiquitous throughout the inside passage. However, concentrations were highest near harbors. The second study, shown on the right side of the screen, examined plastic debris on beaches within Washington state. Researchers found that at the rack line, an average square meter had about 61 anthropogenic pieces of debris or human related debris, and that most of this debris actually originated from within the region. A study published by DeForges et al. in 2014 actually assessed the widespread distribution of microplastics in subsurface seawater. So we're talking about 4.5 meters below the surface. Results from this study are shown um, as a color um, concentration gradient. So here we can see areas in red or orange uh, right here had the highest concentrations of microplastics and then areas with blue or purple had the lowest concentrations. So here we can see Queen Charlotte Strait in red had the highest concentrations found in the study, followed by the Northern Strait of Georgia. Results from this study suggest that populated nearshore environments may have higher concentrations of microplastics in subsurface seawaters as a result of close proximity to anthropogenic sources as well as nearshore currents. Marine plastics can physically and chemically affect fish upon consumption. The physical effects from primary consumption or direct consumption can include obstruction of feeding appendages, which can limit um, the overall intake of food, as well as gastrointestinal tract blockage and translocation to other tissues. Translocation can only occur um, with nanoparticles and occurs on a cellular level. Chemical effects may occur from the chemical ingredients in the virgin plastic or from sorbed environmental chemicals that are leached after consumption. And when I say sorbed environmental chemicals, I mean if a piece of plastic is floating in seawater um, and that seawater happens to have environmental chemicals like PVDEs in it, um, those environmental chemicals can actually adhere to the plastic and then after consumption can be leached into the organism. 
It's worth noting that the extent of chemical bioaccumulation in marine biota from plastic debris consumption is not well known, but chemical effects that may occur include a reduction in foraging efficiency, a change in schooling behavior, as well as a change in an individual's metabolic rate. Varied and sometimes contradictory laboratory results um, indicate that effects associated with marine plastics may be unique among species, types of contaminants, and types and sizes of plastics. So I'm going to briefly highlight three studies um, demonstrating that. The first study was published by Rochman et al. in 2013, and this study was really focused on examining the effects or yeah, the effects from direct consumption of virgin and sorbed plastic in Japanese madaka. And so here we found that um, after consuming virgin plastic, these fish had mild liver stress, whereas if they consumed sorbed plastic, so plastic with environmental contaminants attached, it had actually increased liver toxicity and pathology, so a more adverse effect with the sorbed plastic. An additional study published in 2018 um, by a different group of researchers uh, tested for virgin and sorbed plastic effects on rainbow trout. And this study actually found that there was low to negligible effects um, on the rainbow trout's liver. Lastly, Cedarval et al. published a study in 2012 looking at secondary consumption of plastic in crucian carp. So crucian carp, after um, consuming prey that had consumed plastic, exhibited lipid metabolism and behavioral changes, which led to less food intake. Within zooplankton communities, feeding behavior and physical characteristics influenced the quantity and size of marine plastics ingested. One of the first observational studies along the British Columbia coastline published in 2015, discovered that encounter rates resulting from ingestion were one particle for every 34 copepods and one particle for every 17 euphosids, otherwise known as krill. The plastic encounter rate for both species was similar across the four regions that were sampled. However, the ingestion rates for both of the species were highest in the Strait of Georgia. So this suggests that there's no relationship between exposure and ingestion rates in this study. Now, through laboratory studies, Cole et al. found that 13 out of 15 zooplankton species consumed plastic after exposure. Additionally, when nanoparticles were eaten, it significantly reduced the quantity of algae eaten by the copepod Centropagus typicus. Now this copepod is pictured in the photo on the bottom right, and the green neon patches are actually the microplastic that this specific copepod consumed. Research on marine plastic consumption in forage fish is limited. Hifner et al. determined very few sand lance and herring actually consumed plastic. So this was based on field observations that they conducted. Also, the researchers found no relationship between exposure and ingestion rates for these forage fish species. Therefore, this study found no evidence to suggest that forage fish are a conduit for secondary plastic consumption in salmon on the outer coast of the British Columbia coastline. It is important to note that um, these results are not inclusive of spatial or temporal variations and might not necessarily hold true for other areas within the Salish Sea. Unfortunately, very little is known about the impacts of marine plastics on salmon through direct or indirect consumption in the Salish Sea. Using zooplankton feeding rates from laboratory data, this forages at all tried to estimate uh, consumption rates in juvenile and adult Chinook. So based on the laboratory data results, they've estimated that juvenile Chinook could consume between two to seven microplastic pieces per day per fish, and that number increased dramatically for adults, where they've estimated adult Chinook could consume up to 91 microplastic pieces per day per fish. So putting those consumption estimates to the test, Collicut et al, published a study in 2018 where they actually um, 
conducted observational data or field studies um, to try and determine the actual rate of consumption in juvenile Chinook. And they found that on average, juvenile Chinook were ingesting about 1.15 microplastic feces per day per fish, and that these consumption rates were not leading to significant mortality events. Additionally, um, the researchers determined that the amount of microplastics in seawater and sediment samples uh, was not correlated with the amount that the juvenile Chinook consumed. Now, Collicutt et al.'s study is one of the first within the Salish Sea to examine salmon ingestion rates of microplastics, and additional research is ongoing. So to summarize everything I've prevent, presented this far, uh, results from laboratory studies are highly variable because of the diversity of experimental designs being used to test for effects, which makes it really hard to draw broad scale conclusions. The observational studies that do exist indicate that current plastic exposure and consumption rates are not leading to significant mortality events for zooplankton and fish in the Northeast Pacific Ocean. Note, these studies do not assess the chemical effects um, that may be associated with the observed plastic ingestion rates. In addition, the observational studies seem to suggest that the exposure and ingestion rates um, do not seem to be correlated based on the studies that we did review. And lastly, uh, based on the existing field studies, marine plastics currently do not seem to be a threat uh, to salmon survival in the Salish Sea. Looking ahead, if researchers are interested in increasing their understanding to the extent to which salmon and their prey are exposed to plastics in the Salish Sea, broad scale sampling and comprehensive modeling will be needed. Existing and ongoing plankton sampling, such as the Puget Sound Zooplankton Monitoring Program, present an opportunity for concurrent microplastic sampling to assess its uh, um, distribution and abundance within our area. And lastly, Future marine plastic research should focus its aim on determining ingestion rates for target species based on geographic area to more accurately assess the biological and ecological risks. Thank you so much for tuning in. That's all I have for you today. But if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Long Live the Kings and we'd be happy to answer them. Thanks.